to the presentation. Please use the chat function to pose your questions. Thanks again for being here, and here is Dr. Ron Boring. Thanks, Matt. And um, just want to acknowledge a few people who joined us today, like Lou Haynes, I see on there. Uh, he's the person who nominated me for for uh, the, the becoming a fellow of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, and also um, uh, really one of the pioneers in um, human factors and nuclear. So I'm honored to, to be here today. Um, in, in terms of why did I sign up for this? We'll call this more of a, a service, not that I particularly want to give this talk. Um, and, and so I, I, I tried to challenge myself to, to talk about some, some novel things. I think the way that the presentation is going to unfold, hopefully it's um, at a you know high enough level that everybody uh, follows along. I'm not going to do a, what I would consider a super deep dive into um, uh, automation approaches and things like that. So if you're looking for the the hard take engineering uh, insights on automation and AI. This isn't going to be the presentation for you, but I am going to talk about where humans fit into that process. And I will uh, also talk at the very end about nuclear. So stick around. I know we have an hour and a half. I have no intention to talk for an hour and a half. Um, uh, you don't want to hear me talking for an hour and a half, and I certainly don't want to hear me talking for an hour and a half, but I do hope we have some time for, for questions and interaction at the end. So the title of this presentation is The Future is Automated, but we still need humans. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. OK, um, when you see this, I mean, what do you think? So so obviously we have a car accident. Uh, it doesn't look like any fatalities were involved, fortunately, uh, but certainly a fender bender and uh, something that may have totaled two cars there. So uh, an inconvenience and, and potentially even some injuries involved. And so when you look at this, I'll just give you a couple reasons how this might have occurred. So the braking system could have failed. The engine could have surged and the car accelerated. Maybe the brake lights of the car in front failed. Maybe the road was slick. Again, doesn't look like we have any weather conditions from this photo. Um, or the driver was distracted and didn't brake in time. Now, I'm going to guess if I ask you to pick one of these options, almost all of you would pick the last one there. Uh, we intuitively assume that the human is at fault, and there's a good reason for that because we often are. So that's probably the most valid assumption. If you were with an insurance company, um, you would probably look to see if, if somebody, um, if, if this could be attributed to a human error. Okay, and that's really the heart of, of what I'm going to talk about. So, so why do we assume this human error? I have my um, my my representative of the human, which is Goofy, ironically not human, but maybe better than Homer Simpson, who we usually throw out there. Um, um, so just as a species, are we just horrendous klutzes who helplessly glide from one era to the next? Uh, yeah, we are actually. Um, and, and so you can get into things like the, this is built into our vernacular, the term error. Going back to Alexander Pope, we have the famous uh, line, to err is human. And, and it, it's so ingrained in, in the way that we approach um, humanity, this, this idea that, that we make mistakes. If, if there's any doubt about that, here I just did a word cloud of some of the synonyms that we have in the English language for error, human error. Okay, there's no shortage of these. Um, it's also part of our education systems, learning. Practice makes perfect implies that maybe we're less than error free the first time we do things, OK? And so this whole system of education is based on the fact that we can improve our performance. Um, I, I won't get, I don't want to get bogged down in, in, in a topic that may be taboo for a more academic forum, but, but it's part of religions, uh, this concept of sin by many different names. So many religions over the millennia have this basis in forgiving or overcoming errors through divine providence or process, OK? This is something that that you have done that you have to overcome. OK, it's an error of some type, okay? a moral error. And then, of course, it's built into our legal system is the concept of crime. Uh, and so we seek to have punishment for and protection from those errors that hurt others. So error is definitely this this ingrained part of how we approach the world. Now, I'm going to give you a few takeaways in, in this presentation. So that we'll start with this first one here. Uh, it's no error to assume that humans are error prone. Uh, we are very error prone. But what I hope uh, by the end of this presentation, if you come along on this ride with me, that, that you'll also see that there might be some 
uh, reasons that humans should stick around in the equation. Okay, so just a very brief outline here of some of the things I'll talk about um, next up. So I'll talk about a, a, a discussion on what makes humans human, and I'll give you a hint, it's not just our error proclivities. Um, we'll, we'll talk about automation, we'll talk about AI, um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with a little discussion on merging humans and automation into interfaces, and specifically with the example of nuclear power and where I think we, we need to go with that. So start right away now with takeaway two. Taking humans out of the loop is not always the answer. Okay, and, and if you think about this, uh, I just said we're very error prone, so isn't the easiest solution just to take us out of the equation? Well, that omits the fact that humans are actually good at some things. And so I hope that you'll get a little bit of a sense for why we want to keep humans in the loop. Uh, for one thing, human error is an adaptive process. It's, it's part of our nature, and it's not actually maladaptive. Uh, we don't approach everything the same way so consistently every time. And, but that also gives us the opportunity for recovery, flexibility, and resilience. Okay. And so this is this is part of who we are, and it's not always a bad thing. The same things that lead to human error also lead to our ability to get to improve the situation. Okay, I'm going to go into some history, and I apologize for some of you who may have attended an AI symposium we had a, a few months ago, but but I, I want to revisit a couple things that we brought up there. 1956. Now I wasn't around at that time. I, there might be a few people in the audience who were, um, and and I've always been fascinated by this year. It, it's the year that predates the famous 57 Chevy, so I had to go dig for what a 56 Chevy looks like. Um, but it's this watershed year. And among other things, you had two congressional hearings on automation. Now we're talking about factory automation and those types of things. Think of this emerging as uh, we're taking people off the assembly line and putting machines into that process. Uh, more importantly from my field in cognitive science and human factors, we had the Dartmouth Summer Workshop on Artificial Intelligence. And I won't read this verbatim here, but uh, there was this proposal that they should look at the concept of artificial intelligence. This is really the first place that I'm aware of that it shows up uh, in, in language. And, and they, they proposed that through this two month summer uh, getaway that perhaps they could solve some of these problems and come up with a human or a machine equivalent of, of human intelligence. Well. Eh, it didn't quite. They didn't quite solve all of that in two months. Um, but you'll, if if you're, uh, if you study AI at all, you'll recognize many of the names of the people who were involved in that. These are the fathers of artificial intelligence. A little bit later, that same year, they had the symposium on information theory at MIT, and this is really where you start to see this concept of information processing theory and the study of cognition emerging. For those of you who study psychology and especially cognition, you'll recognize these are the household names. These are the forefathers of our field. Um, and so very, very interesting year. And, and what you see is I don't think that the birthplace of cognitive psychology, of the study of how we think and, and understand and the birth of AI I don't think that it's accidental that they happened at the same time and even with some of the same cast of characters. Um, they were interested in the same problems, which was deconstructing human thinking into information, which allowed them to make computer models of it. Okay, we're still working on that to this day. And I wanna just take a moment here and, and jump into information processing theory. A lot of this is built on, on the original work of Claude Shannon, and then it was taken as a model for how we approach the world as humans. So we're, we're essentially, I mean, it, it, remember this is, computers are just emerging at this time, but we're already seeing the power in thinking of humans as a type of computer, okay? And so we'll go into information processing. Yes, we did slip in a brief slide for Homer Simpson, as you can see, um, a lot of empty mass there. Okay, and this is a common framework that you see with information processing in computers. Um, I won't I won't belabor this too much or bore you with it, but you have input devices. Uh, you have some sort of central processing unit that ties to some longer term memory. So you have some working memory and some long term memory. And then you have output usually as a screen or speakers or something like that. OK, so pretty standard thing. And we all are very familiar with with this model. OK. Well, you can start replacing some of those elements with humans. So the input device is no longer a keyboard. The human equivalent is our senses. OK. 
the processor is no longer a chip, or maybe back in the 50s it was a series of tubes. Um, it is a brain, right? The memory is your memory, the hard drive storage, right? It's your memory. The output becomes the way that you interact with the world. And I have two examples there with touch and with voice. OK, you take physical action, you communicate vocally. OK, so this is this has become how we kind of look at the world and that uh, we've revisited this and sliced it and diced it uh, many times over the past uh, nearly 70 years. But we, we keep coming back to this framework because it kind of makes sense for the way uh, humans exist. OK, um, and in simplest terms, Coming back to our concept of human error, each of these functions of human cognition presents an opportunity for error. So your input could be, oh, you didn't see the brake light. It's a failure in your visual system, okay, for whatever reason. Uh, it could be a failure in your decision making. You got distracted, so you weren't paying attention. Attention is part of what makes decision making. Uh, it could be an error in memory. Um, uh, if you, for those of you who live in Idaho Falls, you know that there seems to be a great source of confusion about right of way rules at four way stops. So uh, there could be some confusion over the rules involving that. Um, or it could be an action error where you hit the gas instead of the brake. OK, and so you can see lots of opportunity for human error in this. But each of these also presents a way for the human to adapt and actually to respond successfully. So if we put this big picture together, and let's link up the human and a system, and we'll call that human machine interface, has other names, human computer interface, HCI, um, um, uh, different, different forms like that. Um, and the computer output, the monitor say, becomes the human sensation and perception. Okay, that output feeds, becomes the input to the human. The human action, be that clicking a mouse, typing on a keyboard, uh, pushing a button, whatever, touching a screen, um, that is the input to the computer. So it's a feedback loop, okay, continuous feedback loop. And coming back to this topic, I managed to talk this whole time without actually mentioning automation. Um, automation is about improving that feedback loop. If the human is the weak link in this process, how do we improve that by, by uh, how do we improve that process for the human? Or how do we enhance the human ability to be part of the loop? OK, so there it's an interesting process and that kind of sets the stage. So I'm going to with that model, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want you to have takeaway three here, which is if we introduce automation into the system, it's usually not just in isolation. It is because that system serves some purpose for the humans. Humans are ultimately the end users of AI. And so we need to make sure that AI is human centric. OK, so enough of that. The next topic is a little discussion on automation, and, and this will be fairly textbook for for those of you um, uh, who, who deal with automation. So bear with me for a few minutes on that. Um, Sheridan is in in, um, uh, in in human factor circles, really one of the, the most well known uh, advocates for automation. And in his seminal book, Humans and Automation, um, following many, many years of research, uh, he suggested that automation is the mechanization or integration of the sensing of environmental variables. OK, notice sensing is an information processing concept. Your sensation, your perception. OK, so you're automating that process. Um, it is data processing and decision making. OK, so you've got the brain in there or it's mechanical action by motors or devices that apply forces in the environment. Um, so it's the action you take. So you can automate at any of these levels, taking information in, doing the decision making, or actually physically taking the action. And um, an important point here is that uh, automation is using a machine to augment or replace activities normally performed by humans. Uh, it's not just limited to control automation. It can also encompass this information flow. Um, and so there, there are really two types of automation. There's control automation, which is I think what we, we usually think of with automation. Uh, this is the doing part of automation. When we think of, oh, you're going to automate something, you think of it's doing a process. It's performing the physical actions that a human might do. Um, and, and so you can think, for example, um, uh, control automation is you're taking the human out of doing some some physical task 
And you, there, there's obviously significant economic advantages in these types of things. It can lead to things like reducing staffing or training requirements. Uh, you can do a lot of things. You can win a lot in this process. There's also information automation. And this improves the user situation awareness and reduces workload. So this is uh, rather than have, and I'll take a control room example from nuclear, rather than having operators ping ponging around the room looking for key bits of information on the boards, this is bringing that information together in one place. Now that's a simple type of information automation. There's also synthesis of information where you're doing some processing behind the scenes. So you're actually using that to produce a richer picture. This could be things like predictive maintenance, um, prognostic systems that predict something is, is on the verge of breaking. All of these things, um, uh, that's, that's a type of information automation. The machine hasn't done anything, okay? All it's done is it's taken data bits and tried to make sense and convey that back to the end user. Uh, of course, automation historically can be both mechanical and digital, um, but I think that you're seeing that there's a, 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 with the introduction of digital systems, you're seeing a much greater emphasis on the digital form of automation than, than mechanical automation. Okay, so takeaway four to remember here is that automation is both control and information based. Um, it's not just about doing actions, it's also about taking information. And that's that's an important loop and that feedback. It's taking the action, taking information in. Okay. And so if you look at, at uh, again, very information processing centric, if you do a human automation crosswalk, you can see you have um, basic human activities. What do we do as humans? We sense, we perceive, perceive perception is just putting meaning on sensation. Um, you monitor, you take decisions, you take actions, you communicate, okay? All of these have automation equivalents, automatic sensor reading, perception, automatic filtering of that information. So making, taking that raw sensor data and turning it into something meaningful. Uh, monitoring could be change and anomaly detection, decision-making could be control logic, if-then types of rules. Um, uh, taking action is automatic controls and communication is again a two-way street. So um, uh, it, it's output, so it's displaying information. It could also be input, so um, uh, the control systems and those things. So it's both indicators and controls. So lots of opportunity there to automate. But you see, you can also, if you think of this as that feedback loop, there is the opportunity to keep humans in the loop there. Okay, now um, this is the point where um, the psychologists in the room start start rolling their eyes and because we, we're going to talk about Haba Maba and this is um, the, the bane of many um, uh, psychologists because it's such a silly name. It was originally Maba Maba, which is what was men are better at, machines are better at. Uh, we've uh, updated that uh, because this is much more than a gender specific thing. So humans are better at, machines are better at, Haba Maba. This goes back to FITS, obviously a very early system back in 1951, uh, updated many times, including by Alan Swain in 1980, um, did a more systematic review of that. And so what, what, what you have in this list, I have here the HABA part, the humans are better at. Um, and this is to keep you thinking about the fact that, hey, well, again, we don't wanna just take humans out of the loop. There are things that humans are better at. Now, now what's interesting about that is humans aren't necessarily evolving at a as a species, we're not becoming better at tasks, um, uh, but machines are. So this list, if you go back to the original FITS list of 1951 and you compare it to a contemporary list, you'll see that the machines are catching up. Human performance has peaked um, and, and there's only so much we can do to, to, to try to improve human performance. Machines, however, continue to evolve. So I, I've, I've counted here in, in green the areas where I think humans still have a, a clear advantage um, so for things like uh, judgment, uh, flexibility, um, unexpected responses, novel solutions, learning from experience, reason inductively. OK, these are things that that uh, AI has not entirely caught up to us. These other things which we started off with. Um, detection of certain forms of energy, okay? Think of this, uh, our machines are much better at sensors than we are typically. Pattern recognition, well, they're, they've caught up with us and they're exceeding us. They can, they can pick out things that we have a hard time uh, picking out now. So, um, so, so you can see uh, machines are catching up here, okay? Now let's just go to the counterpart of this, machines are better at. 
and I mentioned that list is growing, but if we, uh, there are clearly some things I think monitoring uh, is a type of task. We, we have short attention spans. We're just not very good at monitoring tasks over long periods of time. Uh, and the same thing, routine, repetitive, precise, dare I reference my last name, boring tasks, okay? Um, humans don't like to do those things. Uh, machines uh, aren't impatient. Uh, responding quickly. Um, uh, it's, it's ironic if I talk about nuclear, um, th there's a certain aversion to a lot of automation in nuclear, but, but the thing that's most important, which is tripping the plant, we don't leave that to human response. I mean, humans have the opportunity to, to shut down the reactor, to trip the reactor, but we, the, 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 the automated system, the automated reactor trip system is built in there. So even though we're a little bit suspicious of automation, where it really counts, we're going to rely on it. And that's because the, the plant can trip faster on its own than waiting for humans to respond. Um, handling of complex operations, meaning multitasking, okay, notorious uh, difficulty. Any of us working from home these days know all about multitasking and uh, trying to juggle the toddlers running in while you're giving a presentation or, or whatnot. Deductive reasoning is something that you know, taking information and deducing uh, decomposing it into into meaningful chunks. Uh, we have a lot of biases as humans, so um, we, we tend to not actually be as good at that as as a well designed system. So, and and what the the process of how you decide what the human versus the machine is using is called function allocation. Um, tombs have been written on function allocation, including criticisms of it. But um, you can see where there would be some value in trying to figure out what is the human better at and what is the machine better at and what should we, as we're designing a new system, what should we assign to the machine versus the human? Increasingly, we're seeing this role of teaming, which is human automation integration or human automation collaboration hack, um, where we're trying to see how these two capabilities can complement each other. Here in this next slide, I've, I've, I've shown you one example of um, function allocation. Uh, and then you can see that it's not just a, a simple either or. It's not automated versus manual. Um, there are different degrees of that. And so this particular uh, decomposition of, of automation um, uh, breaks it down into five regions. Okay, when when is the machine preferred? When is a human? Um, one important concept, though, is that um, is this concept of adaptive automation. So this may not be fixed. This may not be set in time for. Uh, when you build a system, and there, there might be times when you need to shift, okay, let the human take charge in certain circumstances or let the machine take charge. And there's been a lot of research on adaptive automation um, and how do you um, allow the system to take over or and, and still have the, the human be uh, aware of what's going on. And this, this is the whole premise of trustworthy AI. Um, do we trust machine enough to do it? especially if it's going to take over for me, okay? Okay, and then here we have, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but, but um, automation can have poor outcomes too, okay? We think of the good uh, out, outcomes of, of automation, uh, so you reduce the operator workload, you can help them be more aware of what's going on, you can help them keep track of things, where they are, and for example, in a procedure, you can make it easier so they don't have to train as much. You can reduce human error as well. Um, there's there's something called the automation uh, paradox, which is uh, by by reducing operator workload, you're boring the operators and they're disengaging. So they may be uh, become complacent or have poor attention. Okay, um, you could have a, a a system that really doesn't perform that well, where the operators uh, don't trust it and want to do manual overrides. You could have a brittle system that doesn't allow the human to respond appropriately. It doesn't give them the full range of human uh, behaviors they'd like. An example from nuclear is the um, uh, N4 reactor, uh, the original implementation of that in, in France, where uh, it became very cumbersome. When the operators knew they had to follow a procedure script, and uh, there was a challenge for them to enter the right script, even though they knew what was wrong. Um, and so they had to force the system to go down the right script. Okay, that it made it harder for them to respond and do what they were good at. So just some examples of that. So keep in mind, automation is not always good. Um, 
Now, here's a little fun thing. Um, I was talking earlier this week with Valerie Gowron, who's one of our uh, colleagues in human factors at MITRE, and, and she kind of walked us through, and just for fun, an example of uh, maladaption uh, of humans to automation. So, so this also gets the idea that automation should never be uh, fixed in place um, because humans are wonderfully and terribly adaptive. Um, and so we can break anything. So here's here's the starting point. Um, uh, uh, humans lock the brakes on slippery surfaces. So we hit too hard, that locks the, the, the wheels, and then uh, we skid out of control. So we developed technology. Human factors played a very key role in this. Uh, the anti-lock braking systems, okay, where the, the wheels didn't lock, and so it allowed them to turn so you wouldn't skid uncontrollably. Um, so some very interesting work there. Well, we learned to use those systems and we adapted. And so what did we do? Well, we became more confident that we would break safely. And so we started driving faster on slippery roads. OK, so we had to invent a new technology solution, which was a collision avoidance system or adaptive cruise control that would slow the car as we got closer to objects, just in case you weren't paying attention or you were too confident in your ability to stop. OK. Now, there was a new problem that emerged from that, so we were paying even less attention. Okay, we're overconfident. We trust our car will stop itself, and we really don't have much to pay attention to anymore, so now we're drifting lanes, okay? Um, and so what did we do there? Well, then we created lane assist warning systems to tell the drivers when they're drifting or even to correct automatically, okay? So you see what's going on here? <laughs> we're very adaptive. But we're kind of intuitively lazy. That's 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 part of human nature. We're we're good at um, we're good at relying on other systems to work for us. Um, and then you know when, once we added the lane assist warning systems, well, we created yet another problem that the car practically drives itself, and humans are paying even less attention. So what's the the solution there? Well, we have autonomous or self-driving vehicles. Okay. So so it's not to say all of this has a cause and effect. Uh, relationship that started with anti-lock braking, but you can see how we haven't necessarily become better drivers. We may have even become worse drivers with the advent of some of these automated technologies that are meant to help us because we rely on them so much um, that we lose our precision, our, we lose some of our, our skills, and, and, and we just become worse at things. Okay, so takeaway five here is um, uh, automation is not a one and done activity because humans are adaptive and automation should be too. And you can take that at many levels of interpretation. One is adaptive automation for context, but also remember that as we automate systems, uh, systems we have this automation paradox where we may actually contribute to humans performing worse, a task where they performed fairly well before. Okay. Now let's let's jump into AI and I will take a quick sip. I'm jumping back into history again. And uh, we really have two types of AI. There's goofy, um, good old fashioned AI, um, which is uh, really started as these symbolic logic systems to represent the basic elements of human thought, like language, numbers, or goals. That translated, we saw the first implementations of these as production systems, which are essentially rule based systems featuring if then logic. The, the first one I think that's that's uh, widely cited is the general problem solver. Um, and you can see how this could evolve into things like chess solving and lots of other things. Um, from there, as we became a little more sophisticated in our cognitive understanding, we created cognitive modeling architectures. There, there's a whole slew of these. I'll just mention SOAR and ACTAR. Might as well keep it at Carnegie Mellon where Newell and Simon were. Um, and they have this heavy emphasis on how humans accomplish goals. So it becomes goal driven. What is the human goal? How does that affect uh, how humans take actions, how they make decisions? Um, and so when we think of AI, I think we often have this, um, this sense that it's all about learning. That's the bias of machine learning. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but really the, the, the goofy focus, the early focus was, and that, by the way, that's kind of a pejorative term, but, but I, I like it anyway. So the, the goofy focus was not to create learning so much, but to capture human-like intelligence of how humans carry out decisions and actions. Now, in contrast to that, 
And in parallel, we have the emergence of neural networks. And these concepts go back to that same period. So we have the perceptron appearing in 1958, which was simply a, a computerized version of a single cell neuron. By the 1960s, uh, we had mathematical algorithms like back propagation that were developed to allow perceptrons to learn through training, okay? You're reinforcing uh, the relationship, the relationship between the ins and outs, between your dendrites and your axons, okay? Uh, so so there, there's some biological plausibility in this model, um, uh, but computationally it was very hard to do because most of our computer systems are serial, so uh, it's, it's hard to create a whole network of these. But eventually, we started chaining perceptrons together and we created neural networks, so more than one neuro, uh, perceptron or neural network. We don't, uh, you know, we don't need to call it a perceptron anymore. And eventually we started layering more and more of these and created deep learning. Okay, so all these ideas have existed since 1958 at least, um, but the technology has taken a while to catch up. And so now um, this is much easier to do, so nesting multiple layers of artificial neurons together is, is of course much easier to do and a, a big part of that is the emergence of parallel computing um, that can actually do these things very quickly real time uh, and actually uh, your graphical processing in it we can we can credit video games for this because um, they need to do things multiply in parallel and quickly and so uh, they actually are the basis for a lot of the deep learning um, advances we've seen in the last five years so um, now, if you take these two types of AI, you have different uses. Goofy is good at following rules and making decisions. Neural networks are good at pattern recognition when they're trained, okay? And so, so let's take our Tesla or any self-driving vehicle as an example. I think people, again, assume that it's all machine learning, but in fact, there's, there's a fair amount of Goofy under the hood. Um, uh, you have the Goofy captures the rules of the road. This is not something that neural networks are particularly keen, especially time sequences, this relationship across time. They're not particularly good at, at picking up these types of relationships. And so procedural knowledge has to be captured in some other way. Um, and, and so what you end up with is you kind of have a Goofy system used for control automation. And then you have neural networks are used to recognize the world. Uh, neural networks are very good at pattern recognition, so they're the eyes on the road. And essentially what they're doing is they're translating the world, all the information in the world, and turning that into information that can be used by the system. So that's a type of information automation. So this is a complementary relationship, and, and we need to remember that. So that takes us to takeaway number six. There's more to AI than machine learning. Don't forget your production systems. Don't forget the origins uh, back in trying to create cognitive models of how humans uh, are intelligent. Okay, artificial intelligence was originally about intelligence, not about artificial learning. Okay, now next up, let's talk about how we merge humans and automation into interfaces. And I will reward you with my seven deadly sins of interface design in the age of AI. It just rolls off the tip of your tongue, doesn't it? Um, so, first thing we'll start with is AI interfaces are ubiquitous in new technologies. And you can see them in things like traffic collision avoidance systems, um, started in aviation, but found in many different um, domains, uh, maritime, cars, etc. That again is a type, largely a type of information automation because it's, it's reflecting hazards in the environment. Of course, it also takes uh, control at some point. Uh, automated hospital records. Again, think of scanning your, your wristband or whatnot. Um, saves a lot of human errors and simply uh, performing the wrong procedures on the wrong people. Okay. We also have control automation. Uh, we've seen the emergence of autonomous vehicles and, and any car you buy now, as I talked about that, evolution from automatic braking systems all the way down to autonomous vehicles. You'll see any car that you buy has is somewhere further along or is somewhere on that in that chain of automation. We're seeing increasing levels of automation in cars culminating in things like the Tesla. Of course, a, a simpler form is uh, climate control um, and then unmanned aerial vehicles, certainly a, a lot of things. And, and this is um, there's some actually some very interesting work on on robotic systems and INL um, and, and one of the keys of this is that by equipping 
a robot or an unmanned aerial vehicle with a degree of autonomy, it is able to do things so you, you don't have to have this one-to-one -one relationship uh, between the, the robot and the human. Okay, it doesn't have to be completely teleoperated. It's smart enough to do some of its own things. It also means that it can get itself out of trouble if it loses the signal and things like that. So this is um, when you're looking at unmanned aerial vehicles and and uh, robots, uh, unmanned gr uh, ground vehicles. You're seeing a lot of this work in uh, human uh, AI teaming or human automation collaboration. That's where a lot of it is really finding its home. So. Let's bring this back to nuclear. Um, we do in our department, we uh, do a lot of um, prototyping of control room upgrades that we then evaluate through operator in the loop studies. And we have our human system simulation lab. I've just I've given you some small uh, slides there. And so we use this. This, 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 uh, this laboratory was built uh, for the purpose of helping the current fleet of reactors upgrade. I believe in there, if you looked close enough, you would see uh, people like Lou Haynes, who, who I mentioned earlier, uh, as part of these uh, workshops that we do, these studies that we do. Now, the, the interesting part of that is that you are starting to see some automation showing up. You'll see information automation. And I, I, I like to show this slide just because we had two different digital interfaces we introduced. So here at the top, this is a, a heat map from eye tracking. So we're looking where the operators are looking and you, where the, the reddish the reddish areas are where they are fixating. And so this is a conventional control board, okay? It's really a one-to-one -one mapping uh, of sensors to indicators and controls to actuators. Um, and so you have a lot of gauges and, and uh, uh, controls on here. And so you see the operators, maybe you can't see it that well, but the operators are looking around different systems. We introduced a conventional distributed control system, DCS uh, system, which is a two screen system. We see that the operators start looking. Now we're actually getting our focusing there. Well, we're actually getting a keyhole effect or tunnel vision because the operators are spending so much time there that they're not looking at the rest of the boards. The rest of the boards haven't become obsolete. There's still important information out there. And then the bottom screen, we introduced a highly uh, information automated overview display. OK, so we're gathering key information. And what you see there is that the operators are looking at that. They're still using these screens here, but they're also verifying some of the information on the thing. So we see how you can, you know, just different types of automation, information automation in this case, uh, can contribute to how the operators are responding to their environment. OK, here's just another example of a, the type of where, uh, where you're starting to see automation entering into control rooms. Um, at the top, you have information automation, which is really uh, overview displays and alarms. In the middle, you have control automation, which includes things like a computer-based procedure and your digital controls, your soft controls, as we call them. And at the bottom, you have some legacy analog uh, control systems and a couple gauges in there. So you can see kind of this hybrid environment. Um, there's not a lot of what we would think of as a highly automated system, okay? Uh, control automation here is really pushing a button and the machine or the control system might execute two or three things, something that required two or three switches before. It's automating those, but we're not letting the plant be controlled by the system. The operator is still very much in charge, which brings me to what's next in this, um, uh, in our work on control rooms. So, so I, I mentioned that uh, the simulator that we work on is really, was really built to support uh, modernization of our legacy fleet of reactors. And when you look at it, when you think about it, the evolution of nuclear control rooms in the first 60 years is less than what we expect to happen in the next 10 years. Um, here's a little tribute to EBR-1 out at the desert site here in Idaho. And you can see the evolution between that and a conventional control room is maybe a better color scheme and more indicators and controls. But really a lot of the functionality is the same, okay? When you move over here, this is a, an example of an all digital control room from Halden Reactor Project in Norway. You can see that this is very different. You have a lot of automated information. Um, you have um, potentially automated functions. And so this is, this is interesting. How do we get from here, which is our current state of practice, our current, uh, 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 the status quo in control rooms to an all digital control room? Moreover, is, is 
when we start building new reactors, and there's been a big push toward this, um, do we start with this legacy control room or do we actually uh, leapfrog and start looking at the digital opportunities? Okay, and that's of course where we're going. So let me give you a tale of two power plants. Uh, the first one is a, uh, this is a true story, although the names have been um, um, made anonymous to protect them, um, but uh, this is a true, true story of, of a nuclear power plant and its, um, um, <coughs> its, uh, 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 its uh, counterparts in um, uh, fossil fuel. So we've got a nuclear power plant with uh, about a thousand megawatt electric uh, capacity. It has a thousand full-time staff with approximately 400 on shift at any time. Okay, we look at its sister fossil plant, same electric output. Um, we have 40 full-time staff, and we have approximately 10 on shift at any time. Okay, so we have a very different ratio there. Um, in fact, we have the full staff capacity there is 10 times less than the number we have uh, at the nuclear plant at any time, okay? So we see that part of this is possible because they have a centralized remote monitoring facility uh, with 10 staff that troubleshoots across 30 plants. Again, this is a type of automation. They're pulling information in. They don't need all of this to happen locally at the plant. They can bring in some of this information. And it's also made, and so it's ultimately made possible through automated plant monitoring and prognostics. So not only are they bringing in information, they're doing things with that information in a meaningful way. So we can alert humans, hey, we think something is going to break. Um, you can deploy those people. You don't need those people standing by. You don't need people necessarily monitoring this 100% of the time. Now, we'll turn here for a moment to new scale. New scale is, of course, the small modular reactor vendor, which has a 12 unit design. Um, it's an interesting model um, because as they were going through the process of licensing it, um, they had to deal with the staffing. These are small modular reactors, OK? I believe it's 60 megawatts electric, somewhere in that, that range. Um, and uh, so to have a whole crew complement, remember, uh, our licensing doesn't distinguish between the output, so it doesn't matter whether you're 60 watt electric or 1000 megawatt electric, okay? Um, uh, to put this all together um, with these 12 simple modules, 12 small reactors chained together would require approximately 576 operators across shifts or about 48 at any given time. So. Instead, through automation, they pushed for one crew across the 12 unit plant. Okay, so they had to actually change the licensing basis and they had to demonstrate that it was safe to do so. So I, I, I point this out because technology is the key to making nuclear power plants cost competitive. We have many programs at INL that, and across the Department of Energy that pursue this very topic. And I, I think a lot of this is converging on the idea of a smart reactor which is really for me, there are lots of interpretations of what a smart reactor is, but for me, a smart reactor is smarter use of staff through automation. Okay, now if you look at nuclear, if you, it's, it's hard to get the exact data on this, but uh, if you look across the 95 plants operating in the US and the various vendors, it's at least an $80 billion a year industry. Of course, it's not consolidated in one, in one company. Um, but if you look at um, uh, the market equivalent, you start to see some very well-known names in that $80 billion a year range. Um, uh, and so we're in good company. And, and so I, 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 one important thing here is to realize that energy is a very significant part of this. Nuclear is a, a, a vital contributor to our energy mix. And we cannot view ourselves as the underdogs. We should be taking the lead. Uh, and we are in some ways. So you're seeing right now, 70 vendors are designing advanced reactors, roughly 70 vendors um, across the world. Uh, Department of Energy, to the best of my knowledge, is moving forward with three test reactors, um, potentially more if you start counting some of the micro reactor designs. Uh, and we have currently operating about 95 commercial reactors that are considering modernization. So this is a big industry. And the question is, how do we then infuse this with this idea of smart reactor? 
Um, and I, I, I'll capture a few of the things that I think matter here. So if we take information um, um, automation, how do you accomplish that? Well, it's advanced visualizations that support synthesis and decision making. Um, if you take, um, uh, you, you can automate a lot of the controls. You can also start getting into this bottom point here of prognostic systems that predict. So one is just taking all the information that's out there, the current state, and putting it together in a meaningful way that doesn't require four people constantly monitoring to figure out what's going on. Uh, the next step of that is, of course, um, uh, bringing in some control automation. And the final step of that is, is actually building in predictive or look ahead systems. OK, so what does that mean for the human? If you have advanced visualizations, you're supporting operator situation awareness. Um, if you have significant information and control automation, um, you have frozen slides. <laughs> there we go. Um, you're able to reduce staffing and operator tedium. Again, the competition is 40 staff at a 1,000 megawatt plant um, versus 1,000 at a nuclear power plant. We need to find meaningful ways to reduce the operator staffing, but we also have safety to consider, okay? And so we, we, we have to take the tedium out of the process that might be there, okay? And uh, as we look at prognostic systems, we're looking to help the operator plan future conditions and avoid unpleasant surprises. So those are some of the, the anchors for a smart reactor. And the point I would make is that the technology is here now. It just needs to be validated and adapted for nuclear applications. I would also add that this is not just for future advanced reactors, but it's also for the current fleet. I think we can, uh, we can uh, definitely inject many of these technologies as we continue to modernize our current fleet of nuclear reactors. So um, I would be remiss, since I'm the manager of the Human Factors Department, if I didn't talk about the role of human factors. Again, human factors is simply the study of, of how humans interact with systems. Okay, And if you take the human machine interface, HMI, that we've already mentioned, um, really as you start to think about smart reactors and automation and AI, you realize that the HMI is no longer just a two-dimensional concept of control board inputs and outputs. It's really about this human machine teaming. So it's AI and the HMI. Um, and, and important parts of that are keeping the human in the loop, which is really the hallmark of explainable AI. It does nothing for us if we have a black box that's making decisions or trying to help us make decisions and we don't understand what it's doing. So explainable AI is about conveying the outputs of that system in a way that's meaningful to the human. And then we also need to keep in mind, again, uh, uh, nuclear is a, a very safety conscious uh, industry. We need to keep human reliability in the picture. And of course, as a researcher, I have to say research is needed, right? Um, uh, so. Uh, if you look at things like what, what NewScale has accomplished, reduced staffing is not a tail end result of automation design. They involved human operators in the very design process and they tested it in the loop until they came up with um, uh, the right level of automation uh, to control that plant. Um, and then we also have to remember that reduced staffing is not just something that's limited to the control room. It should encompass balance of plant activities. How do we facilitate maintenance activities and planning uh, more meaningfully so that we don't have this thousand person complement at the plant. So um, I'll leave you with takeaway seven. Uh, automation is the key to smarter energy in the future. Little pun on smart reactors. And I will actually leave you with the seven deadly sins of interface design in the age of AI. Um, these look suspiciously like your takeaway messages. So hopefully um, if there were any new points in there, hopefully this will help you remember them. Um, so the first deadly sin is assuming humans are perfect or entirely imperfect. The truth is somewhere in between. Um, so there's not much risk of assuming humans are perfect, but uh, it's important to understand that human error is also part of the process that gives us resilience. Okay, Our ability to recover from situations is because we're not um, uh, simply uh, machines following a script, okay? Uh, we, we, we perform things differently, we learn, we adapt, um, and that is also key towards safety, okay? Um, automating 
humans out of the system would also be a bad idea. So remember that humans are better than machines at some things, and we need to always keep that in focus. Um, taking the humans out of the loop is not going to advance the safety of plants. Um, Complementing humans with smart systems can ensure that the plant, newer generation of plants are at least as safe as our current, and maybe even safer. Okay, the next, the third deadly sin is forgetting that humans are the end user of the system. Uh, and again, I just, I, I, I remind you to remember that the purpose of AI is to help humans, not replace them. Uh, my fourth deadly sin was focusing too much on control automation. And the key to this human AI collaboration uh, or human automation collaboration is that the human also gets something meaningful back. They get information that is meaningful to them. And so really one of the keys of this is that you have information automation, not just control automation. My next deadly sin would be presetting the level of automation, so fixing it at a particular level. Um, we really need automation that can help users and the system work together in different contexts, which means sometimes the system may take charge, sometimes the human may, may, may take charge, and we need a dynamic element of that, uh, not set that in stone just at one point. The sixth deadly sin was fixating on machine learning. There's nothing wrong with machine learning, of course, but um, we really need to understand the advantages and uses of production systems and this whole framework of goofy AI that, that uh, existed in parallel with machine learning. Machine learning is a hot topic, but it's not the end all of AI. Okay, and the final deadly sin of uh, interface design was not considering automation in energy systems. Uh, I think the key to a lot of this, I, I, I alluded to safety, but the economics um, are the key to this. Uh, for different energy systems to be competitive, uh, they have to operate to, with some degree of autonomy, uh, using humans for what we're good at, maintenance, monitoring some higher level functions or making key decisions, uh, and letting the system do what it's good at, which is steady state maintenance of energy production. So with that, I will close. I have an old slide, but I love this one. So even though I think we're on our 72nd anniversary, I'm sticking with this one for now uh, because it's such a beautiful setting. So I want to thank you for your time, and I will be happy to entertain uh, some questions or discussion. I'd love to use this uh, kind of as a kickoff for some, um, some discussion on how, what what the role is of automation in, in some of the research we do at, at INL and, and uh, across the universities in Idaho and elsewhere. All right, very interesting, Ron. Thanks so much. So not boring at all. Um, you guys, if you want to ask questions, you can use the chat function, or if you want to raise your hand and talk to Ron uh, directly, feel free to use that. And if you want to go home or, well, you're already home, most of you, but um, I'm okay with that. Yeah. No questions? Oh. <laughs> Covered it all. All right, here's one. Okay, it's from Hiram. Uh, do you see automation negatively impacting the job market? Oh, somebody had to throw that question. Hiram, I thought you were facilitator for this. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about um, reducing staffing. So that's a an unfortunate um, necessity for the competitiveness. Now, I think one of the things that we, as we move forward also on uh, renewables, we see that there is a fair amount of, of labor involved. We're, we're very good on our fossil fuels um, of producing energy very cheaply, okay? And so um, th there's a, but there's obviously that the whole carbon footprint aspect of this that we don't fully address. Um, so renewables and, and nuclear, um, th there is still a role for humans in that. And a lot of it is 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 um, a very skilled type of work. So, but I don't think the plant of the future is going to be a thousand person plant. That's not um, a sustainable model in our current climate. So um, whatever the number ends up being, hopefully um, it's a highly skilled position, right? Um, 
not a satisfactory answer, but um, we have economists working on that part. And I, I obviously, I'm uh, as a human factors person, I'm concerned about the impact of where we might eliminate jobs um, uh, that are important to local economies. So I, we haven't solved all that yet. All right, here's another one. It's um, sort of a statement from Shelley. Um, I'm interested in de-skilling as we m use more AI. I used to have a ton of phone numbers memorized. Now I know no phone numbers. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it, it's definitely um, a, an issue. And actually, I don't know if you've seen, um, there have been a couple news articles coming out in the last few days about pilots, as pilots have uh, resumed, uh, commercial pilots have resumed, commercial, uh, as they've resumed flying. Uh, a lot of them have not been flying, and so they're rusty. And so we're seeing this increase in, in human errors um, in aviation, uh, an area that's been pretty rock solid. And, and the reason is simply because they're not getting the practice. Um, so that's a really interesting topic for automation too, because we still require our control room operators, our pilots to be highly skilled, so much so, like in nuclear, they, they, the, the operator, reactor operators uh, go in for training every five to six weeks, okay? That's how critical it is that they maintain um, their proficiency. Automation can hopefully get us beyond that point where um, we have to have that high level of practice to continue to perform the task successfully. So um, we see it everywhere from phone numbers to pilots um, forgetting how to uh, adjust landing gear properly. Um, so definitely a, a challenge. I, I've, I've found my de-skilling is uh, taking form in face-to-face -face interactions, you know, things like, wait, wait, if you actually encounter someone in person who isn't in your family and you, wait, I'm, I think I'm supposed to smile and make eye contact, right? The, the artificiality of, of working in this, this room and interacting with the world through um, a web conferencing has, has, has de-skilled me in my interpersonal skills, not that they were that high to begin with. <laughs> um, all right, here's a good one. It's a it's a good um, teaser for the next month's code breaker, which is exactly one month from today. Um, Eleanor asks. Uh, so next month we have Ron Fisher uh, is going to come oh. on and talk about um, infrastructure. Uh, I like the Ron's team. Yeah. Know. All right. <laughs> so uh, Eleanor asks, how does automation impact control systems, cybersecurity, and resilience? Oh, big topic. Um, come to next month's code breaker. Um, no, this is this is um, obviously a huge challenge uh, because as we automate systems, then we have to rely on their function. Right? This gets back to the whole trustworthy topic. And if those systems are compromised, how do we how do we know, right? So for me, the the, the cybersecurity angle I've always taken is that the first line of defense, one of the lines of defenses is um, the actual operator of a system. Okay. Uh, the first line is, is wrong order because we have all sorts of defense in depth to prevent anything from happening, but the operator should be able to recognize what's going on. So do you have independent systems that are monitoring the type of information flow, that are monitoring that something doesn't seem right? Uh, do we need to build these types of things in smart detector systems? I think we, we're doing that type of research already, um, but it's um, uh, certainly the the more we take humans out of the loop the more opportunity there is for some cyber intrusion nuclear right now is largely analog um it's not a you know the, the the in the us i should say there's there's not a lot of opportunity for significant cyber threat in the control of that reactor um as you've introduced newer uh, uh more digital um uh, control systems there's still a big push to retain some analog backup systems so you can at least safely shut down the plant um, so, but yeah, looking forward to Ron Fisher's talk next month. Okay, sorry, I just got kicked out. So I just got, I just reconnected. Oh, okay. Let me find, let me find the next question. We had a, several more come in on that. Yeah. Okay, so. From uh, Zachary. Yeah. Um, he asked, do we have adequate techniques to understand the impacts, positive or negative? that new automation and legacy systems may have on operations? Huh. I think Zach seeded that question because we're actually working on that project. Um, uh, that's that's how we came in this conversation with Valerie Garon. Um, 
the, the question is we have all of these safety techniques. So for example, human reliability analysis that, that really look at the impact of human error on a system. But the, but the problem is that we're not very good about um, creating models of what human actions uh, may may come forth with new systems. What are the emergent properties of introducing a little bit of digital here? Um, um, uh, Zach could give the Zach gives a great talk on the 737 Max. So uh, where they introduced a new, not actually huge, uh, automation system, uh, what for level control um, that backfired horribly in a few cases, as as we're all familiar. And so um, the question then is. How can we anticipate? So, so what sort of modeling, what sort of risk modeling do we have to, to um, anticipate the consequences of introducing these types of systems? I think we're still working on that. Zach and I are actively engaged in a product or project on that very topic. So anything you want to add to that, Zach, you can unmute if you want. I love putting Zach on the spot. <laughs> oh, he is unmuted. I think you fielded the question great. I think the, the trick is there's so much more than just, um, you know, the human automation, human automation interaction that needs to be considered and sometimes that's not captured in some of our current stuff. So, um, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I'm excited to see what we find out. And, and the other part of this is as we, as we automate, you know, little parts of things, we maybe don't change the whole concept of operation. That's the question. That's exactly what happened in the 737 MAX. We just changed one little thing, but it had huge consequences in the overall system. And so we have some approaches that we use in human factors, like integrated system validation, where we try to look at, um, we try to test things in context, in the overall context of use, uh, not just in isolation. All right. So another question from Anna Hall. Um, she says, great talk, thank you. You mentioned that automation should occur across the plant and not just the control room. Are there any plant systems that INL is working toward that have no humans in the loop? Um, well, there's the, the big question of, of uh, the micro reactors, the very small reactors um, um, that are really designed to run autonomously for long durations of time. We see this, for example, in the space batteries. Um, and deploying that at a local level. So, so one of the and it's something I didn't actually put in my my talk was uh, I mentioned concept of operations, which is you know this your whole it, it's your model of how operators interact and control the plant con ops. Well, we we've been looking at this and and now as we're getting to systems that are totally autonomous, such as some of the proposed micro reactors, maybe we're shifting to what we're we're starting to call affectionately conmon concept of monitoring. So the human doesn't really have a role in the control of that system. So why do they even need to know? Well, they need to know if it's malfunctioning and they need to know if it's about to malfunction. So predictive maintenance or uh, if the system needs to be taken offline, if there's a safety issue or something like that. So there's still a role for monitoring and that gets us more into that um, information automation topic. Um, uh, so that that's one system. Again, that's um, I'm not sure that addresses fully the balance of plan, but that is one place where we're seeing this this um, uh, um, focus outside the control room, outside the traditional control room. And I'm sure there are other systems, lots of people on here, I'm, I know we're working with other parts of uh, systems. So uh, you, know, you, you can build in automated functions for, um, uh, you know, uh, an example might be um, uh, turbine, uh, you know, the turbine system on a plant. Now it's still connected into the control room, but you can you can actually do a lot of automated functions. You can actually build a uh, turbine system that starts up automatically, that adjusts itself and even uh, shuts itself down. So um, you don't need a lot of humans in that process. Um, it's not, not the energy production part. It's still controlled from the control room though, so. <laughs> Matt's still on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yep. Um, this is from Victor Walker. Great presentation. Are there ways where we can use the human interactions to improve the automation, such as using the humans to better train the system on how to communicate or respond? Oh, good topic. Um, Victor is actually one of our AI researchers here, so I, I sense um, I sense he's on the verge of a new research topic there. Um, um, 
Uh, good point. So could we take um, the types of, of communications that we expect and train the system on that? There, there, um, there, there's been a little bit of work um, uh, at Virginia Commonwealth um, that, that was looking at training the system kind of in parallel to the um, to, to natural language. So, so it's a verbal statement so that so so uh, you have a control system that's um, again a fairly black box it's, it was actually a neural network system it's it's um, controlling and we want the human to know what's going on but the problem with neural networks is there's no cognitive penetrability we can't look in there and just uh, look at the network and understand what's going on so it has to have some way of conveying it so so what they're doing is a, they're training it to have, um, verbal information that would essentially tell the operator why it made it, why it did a particular control action. So, so there's some precedence there. Victor does some great work on narrative, and I'd love to see um, uh, have that follow-on conversation with you because you might be go you might be angling more towards um, uh, narrative structure and some of those things. As really, Victor's worked a lot on using AI to communicate, or, or, um, and I, I think you might be going that direction, Victor, so we should have a follow-on conversation there. It'd be fun. All right, <clears throat> last one from Lawrence Wellman. Is there a difference for the HABA for individual versus groups of people? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on how AI impact positively, negatively, larger groups of people versus the individual? Very good question, uh, Lawrence. I haven't actually thought much about that. So. We're just um, uh, team cognition is is um, I, I would call it an emerging topic. I mean, it's been around for at least a decade, um, and I but I don't know the the direct relationship to some of the AI systems. So so I think I, I'll give you one quick example that that comes to mind readily. Um, if you think about information automation. Um, one of the things that we're doing is is trying to create group view displays, so these common overviews that multiple people can can share information with and at least have a common frame of reference. Um, but that that's something. Um, the teamwork element, I, I like this, Lawrence. Um, I don't have a, a quick answer there though. I'm gonna. I, I see Lou and Marv on there. These are these are my mentors, and I'm just curious. I I want to hear from them. Feel free to unmute if you have any insights. Of course, I usually throw hard questions I can't answer at them. But um, both Marv and Lou have been uh, our former presidents of the Human Factor Society. And uh, when I named these names, these guys knew these people. So this is Marv or Lou, any, any thoughts on the HABA and teamwork? That's a really interesting topic. It's a huge question. Uh, I think the uh, it, it's been studied. The the issue for me is uh, shared mental models mm -hmm. and the question of designing a representation system so that uh, which you just talked about so that uh, each of the team members has at least some common core. Uh, that's that's easy to state the problem, how to accomplish it and how to verify that in fact the the members have common uh, 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 representations is more difficult. Uh, there years ago they used to say uh, you know design to you should design to match the user's mental model. That's backwards, at least for a new, it, 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 mm. uh, for a, a safety critical plant uh, situation. You need to make sure you need to design so that the users have shared, have the similar mental models. And to, to me, that's kind of the essence of, of the, the issue. There's also, um, th thanks, Mark. Um, um, there, there's also some uh, work, uh, military sector, you know, as we augment information that's available to combatants, for example, how do we share 
it's very important so we can supplement the information that they have available. But how do we make sure that um, they're aware, say the, 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 um, the medic is aware where the combatants are, right? There's, you need some integration of information. That's an example where they're using AI to try to, to bring information uh, together so that you have awareness of what's going on. What are the other people doing? Right? That's uh, mutual awareness is, is one of the terms used there. So a uh, very interesting topic, or very interesting topic, Lawrence. And thanks, Mark, for weighing in. And Lou, I don't know if you had anything to add. I haven't seen Lou in about a year, so I'm just delighted to see his face there. Um, we've been talking on the phone, but not uh, face to face. So. Oh, looks like your audio, maybe your microphone isn't working, so that might be. Uh, we're not hearing you, Lou. So now, nice try. I now that I know you have the the keys, we're not going to talk on the phone anymore. We're gonna we're gonna do the face to face. <laughs> it looks like the mic isn't picking you up right now. Any other questions, anybody? Well, thank you so much, Ron, for for this presentation. Yeah, I, again, a fascinating topic. I mean, automation is very complex, so there's there's so many facets to it. Um, just remember, humans are part of that loop, and don't take us out. Okay, uh, um, we we you know we have something to contribute to the control or monitoring of a system, and that's that's the point that I want you to take away here. Lots of different technologies out there. We're we're being bombarded with with um, new capabilities almost every day. Um, and, but the heart of this is we have to we have to figure out, especially as we're working with energy systems or any safety critical system, how much do we want to forfeit that control versus um, retain control uh, with the human, and how do we do that meaningfully? So that would be my closing thought. And thank you all. Uh, glad to have some people who are willing to give up a, a Thursday afternoon and uh, spend some time with uh, talking about this stuff. All right. Thanks again. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Ron. Thank you.